the subject of the sermon today is actually the Bible. You know, it used to be in uh, John Calvin's church that at the beginning of worship, this Bible wouldn't be up here. It would be in the back, and just at the beginning of the worship, an elder would call out, all rise for the presentation of the word, and then somebody would come up and place the Bible in front. It's that kind of reverence for the Word of God in our tradition. Certainly that kind of reverence that I have for it. Would you pray with me? Spirit of God, a lot of people don't like your text. And there are probably some good reasons for that. It's a little confusing in our day and age. But give us the wisdom to read from it who you are and what you desire from us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I don't know what it is about uh, chapters 3, verse 16 in the Bible, but we're reading 2 Timothy 3.16 which I like better than the other one, frankly. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that is, right relationship with God. That the person of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. I like it. <laughs> the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. I really like the comedians Penn and Teller. They've probably given you a laugh at one time or another. A week and a half ago or so, I ran across a, uh, a video where Penn, was, uh, Penn Gillette was talking about things that didn't have anything to do with humor. He explained that when he was 16 or 17 years old, he made a deal with his parents. He didn't have to go to church if he went to youth group. And at youth group, apparently what happened is the pastor, who he obviously liked, even still today, would invite them to examine their faith, to ask adult questions about their faith. And he took that very seriously, and so he explored. And one of the things he did at that time is he read the Bible from cover to cover. And what he says is that it's the quickest way to make somebody an atheist. The easiest way to make somebody an atheist is you give them the Bible, you tell them to read it from cover to cover. There are some horrible stories in this book. I wonder if you know the story about the Levite's concubine who was gang raped. You know what his response was? Hack her into 12 pieces and send them to the 12 tribes of Israel so that they would be angry and bring up war. That's actually in the Bible. So I understand his point of view a little bit. <laughs> and, you know, at one point, God demands that, that the people of Israel devote the other nations. That is to say, wipe out every man, woman, child, and piece of cattle in the land. Slavery is certainly accepted, sometimes even celebrated. There's hostility to homosexuality. There's also no sense of common humanity. That is, you know, there's really only Israel. We're God's people, and the others don't matter so much. And then the Christian scriptures, well, they're a little confusing when you think about it. I mean, for instance, there's a great deal of argument about whether the Apostle Paul even wrote 2 Timothy. Scholars are pretty sure he didn't write Colossians. Ephesians, there's some question. Don't worry, Romans and Galatians and Corinthians, they're okay. You know, the Gospels aren't history. It's storytelling. Preachers told stories about Jesus. That's what was happening. And speaking as a preacher, I can tell you that preachers just, it's unforgivable to let, you know, let facts get in the way of a good story if you're trying to make a point. And so they disagree, and there's tension within them. Clearly, parts of the Gospels disagree with parts of what Paul says. There's, 
there's tension in all of this, and so we understand why reading it all might make someone an atheist. Penn talked about the joy and the passion and the love and the freedom he felt when he realized he could say there was no God. How many people do you know like that? I imagine a lot, and that's because, as he points out, back in the early 60s when he was growing up and doing this examination, he was in the minority. Now he's in the majority. Most of our culture feels this way about Scripture. Most of us. In fact, it's almost become an industry. Right? You know, it's like there are all these documentaries about Jesus, and there's the Jesus Seminar. Everybody's trying to break down what the Bible says, show it as an ancient document that isn't true. Everybody undercuts the, uh, the stories about the miracles and so on and so forth. I mean, the virgin birth, oh, come on. That kind of thing. It's practically an industry. You know? There are cultural references everywhere. I mean, when you're watching TV... Well, you're not preachers, so maybe you don't feel this way, but whenever a pastor comes on the screen in a TV show, I cringe. You know, because they're you know, either insipid, all right, and bland, you know, or they're pedophiles. Take your pick. It's practically an industry to tear this down, and so we understand why people would feel the way, we, uh, the, the way Penn feels why it's becoming the majority. The trouble, of course, is a lot of that, a lot of that criticism is true. But partial. True, but partial. And it raises this second theological question. You know, this is part of a series of sermons. The reason revelation question. Last week we did nature grace. How do we understand the God of nature versus the God that's revealed to us in other ways? Reason revelation. What are the sources of knowledge that we have to be able to tell something about our, the nature of our creator and our creation and where we fit within it? How does that fit? And it always comes down to the two, well, we can reason it out by looking at the world around us. But there's also this direct revelation that comes our way. That God speaks to us. We know God in ways that we can't reason out. There's always some tension between those two things that lives, and it's an important question to try and define. And what's fascinating about it is the question itself almost maps onto our brains, reason and revelation. So you've probably heard some of the theory of left brain and right brain. Certainly the first iteration of left brain and right brain has been proved to be oversimplified. All right? But the way it was, was it like, well, the right brain, that's the creative stuff. All right? So creative people are right brain people. All right? And then the logical people, well, they're left brain people. Well, you can't do anything logical without the right brain, and you can't do anything creative without the left brain, so that's not going to work out too well. But there are differences between those hemispheres of our brains. Following the work of Ian McGilchrist, who's a scholar at uh, Oxford, quite remarkable. I won't say I've read his works. I mean, we have two volumes on our shelf, you know, and I've, I'd say I've given it two, one sentence a paragraph. Took time enough. But he talks about the right brain being that which takes in all the data, takes in the facts, takes in all the things that our senses offer us, takes in the perceptions, takes in all the things that we observe. And it's always active, it's always there, so that if something happens that you haven't consciously noticed, boom, it'll come to you if you need to know it. The left brain? The left brain brings order to the chaos. The left brain is about trying to make a map 
of the territory that the right brain is aware of. Because you see, we can't be aware of it all the time. We have to give it some structure, some map, so that we can deal with the reality that we're living in. And the interesting thing is that as we grow up, we go through phases of making maps and getting rid of maps. So the first map, it seems, that we make is when we're around two. No. Hear that word from two-year-olds. That's because whatever it was that you've asked them to do or told them they can't do doesn't fit in to the map that they've made of the world that they think they live in. So no. And they resist that. We, we do resist when people want to change our map. Then we get a little older, you know, 10 years old. I think I told you the story about my son Benjamin and the conversation he had with his mother. And he explained to his mother when he was about 10 that boys can be doctors and girls can be nurses. And his mother went back and said, yeah, well, that's true, but it's also true that girls can be doctors and boys can be nurses. He said, no. Boys can be doctors, girls can be nurses. They went back and forth until finally he said, look, boys can be doctors, girls can be nurses. It's a rule. <laughs> it's a rule. He'd made a map. He'd taken in his observations. He'd taken in the attitudes of people around, and he had found a rule. And you know how kids are at that age. There are rules. They want things to be set up so that they can depend on them. It's just kind of natural. And so we go through life with this cycle. We, we gather up information with our right brain, and our left brain makes a model of it, a map of it. And then we find out that that map doesn't serve us very well. We resist it, but eventually that map has to collapse, and we gather more information, more impressions, more observations, and we make a new map. That's kind of a cycle that we go with. You know, it's kind of interesting that uh, the next phase after Benjamin's phase, it's around 16, 17 years old, like Penn Jillette. He's looking to make a map, trying to understand the world he's in. And, and he made a map at that point that really only had reason attached to it. He could only look at the data in front of him, and he could, he could see in the scriptures that something was wrong with that data. It didn't fit into his worldview as it was developing, and he made a brand new map, leaving it out, leaving the God who can't be reasoned out. And what's interesting is whole cultures go through this same cycle making a map, resisting the change of the map, taking in new data, and making a new map. For months, we've been reading First and Second Samuel, move into First Kings soon. And that's about a moment in history when they were making a new map, and it wasn't easy. Right? These people were moving from being tribal to being national, from being related because they're of the same blood, to being related because they all have the same story about the way the Creator is operating in the universe and what's expected to them. It's a new map, and they're struggling with it, and they're struggling with the whole move with making a map about what human beings are supposed to do. You know what the problem was in the story today? Why does it matter that you counted all the people? Well, there are two things that happen when you count all the people. You know how many people can be sent to war, and you also know how to tax them. And the tribes who had been independent for a long time were now, for the first time, brought under this framework with the king, David, and there's resistance as the map is changing and reforming. We've been going through something similar over the last couple of hundred years. That map they made 2,500 years ago to 4,000 years ago, it's not, it's not working so well. It doesn't fit 
the facts and the observations that we've gathered in human society. It's not a world that centers on the earth. And we know it's not. And you get enough data, and finally that map collapses, all right? But here's the thing, the church has resisted that change, still does to this day. Resists the idea that a great deal of data in this book simply is not viable in the world in which we live. But we're starting to have to face facts because people are leaving us in droves. And the thing is, as they do, as they have left, the new map they've developed is like Penn Jillette's. It, it tells you about the God that you can reason out by looking at the world around you. But it tells you very little about the God who can be known because God reveals it to your soul. And it's an inadequate map. It's particularly inadequate as we are facing tumultuous society changing change, and it's happening fast, very fast. This iteration of the map is starting to come apart. It offers no foundational purpose. Why would you bother to be good with this map? Penn says that, you know, he felt free to love, to care for people of other sexual orientations, to look for justice for women. He felt inspired, passionate about these things. He could now become a good man, the kind of good man that the church taught him how to be when he was a kid. But without that foundation there, what would be his reason? What is the ultimate purpose that's going to count? What's, what's the foundation in creation that's going to unfold in his heart that's going to take care of him as society offers deep and penetrating challenges? An example of a world without, without purpose. Men are having a hard time these days. It's not even okay sometimes to talk about it because women have been having such a hard time for so long, all right, that it's important to talk about women's role in society. And anything I say right now is not a zero-sum game. It's not like it's men or women. But men have a particular challenge right now because for centuries, our being has been defined by the work we do. And the jobs are disappearing. And they're, they're threatening to take more away. And, and as that happens, as you lose that sense of purpose and you can't grasp onto anything deeper, there is a deep kind of loneliness that overcomes you. There's a stark rise in the suicide rates in men, particularly those who are not educated. That's the very center of the opioid epidemic. And I, I think it's why the MAGA movement. I may not appreciate the political ideas of the MAGA movement, but I certainly get the anger. I certainly get the frustration. I certainly get the fear. With, with a lack of purpose, Things fall apart. As the map goes down, though, we need to turn from a God that can only be reasoned to the God that can be known because that God lives within us. And that is what this book offers. Because these people, as they were going through their struggles, trying to move from tribes into nations, 
They had God at the center of that. They were looking to understand the nature of the God that was touching them. And, and it's that that becomes revealed in this text. Yeah, they didn't understand how the planets moved in the sky, but they understood a whole lot more about God than our current culture does. And we do well, we do well to pay attention. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training, all of it for righteousness, a right relationship with our Creator, with the love that unfolds creation within us and without us. That's what it's here for. It's not here as a science textbook. It's not here as a sociology textbook. It's not there to describe mathematics. Heck, the mathematics in it is usually wrong. It's not there for those. It's not even a particularly good ethical manual because our ethics have evolved. Now, now the structure of God behind the ethics, well, well, that's what's driven our ethics forward. So understanding what God would want and the direction God is moving that we can discern in the pages of this book, well, that, that's going to lead us to act rightly. But Penn's right. Slavery is, uh, is celebrated, and so is war. So, so it's God that we're reaching to understand in these pages, not looking for a manual for life exactly. Because God, you know, didn't write it. It says it's inspired by God. Where, where did it come from? You know, some people figure that, you know, the first five books, God dictated them into Moses' ear. And I, I understand that from a certain point of view, but that, that map isn't going to work for us. No, I think where it came from is way more impressive. Through all the centuries... All of those people trying to discern and understand what God was doing in the midst of their culture and in the midst of their lives. These people debated, argued, sought the presence that lived within them and wrote the only way they could from within their own worldview with deep insight. And then it was edited again and again and again. Because sometimes we think God's revealing things to us and God isn't. So generation after generation after generation, God draws these texts together. God interpenetrating all of our lives and all of theirs as it unfolds year after year after year until it can offer a clear picture of who God is and who God wants us to be, a clear picture if we are approaching it the way they did the original job, seeking the presence and the beauty of God within it. That's what the Bible's there for, to describe the God that can be known because God reveals God's nature to us. Of course, we have to describe that God in, in the reasonable world that we recognize. And that is our job, and that is what makes it harder for us. It was just plain easier for Augustine. You know, he didn't have the whole worldview problem. He wasn't worried about miracles. Just easier. Heck, it was easier for me the 1950s, probably for you too, but it's harder now because we're reaching into the book and drawing something out that is not necessarily on the surface, but it's real, and it can spark our lives, and give the kind of purpose that allows us to develop a map that changes the direction of our society because God can be known. That's what we're all doing now. The people we meet who call themselves atheists, 
Most of them aren't agnostic, but those people, they're going to need a better map. And I'm hoping the church can offer it because we've got it. Let's pray. Holy One, sometimes I wish that I was preaching during the years my father preached and didn't have to worry about this. But the reality is we are developing a new map and if we're going to include you in it, we need the insight of the texts that your interpenetrating work have brought into being and offered to us. Inspire us and give us the wisdom to find you within them. In Christ's name we pray.